Alcatraz Prison started being constructed in 1859, though it was originally a military base built on a 22-acre island, 1.25 miles off the coast of San Francisco Bay. A cell house wasn't actually built there until 1910 with a 500 feet long concrete structure, the longest concrete building in the entire world at the time. During the 1920s and 30s, there was a huge crime wave, and this new prison was hoped to reduce the number of criminals in the area. By 1934, hundreds of thousands of dollars were poured into modernizing the structure, making it supposedly inescapable. This particular place wasn't for regular prisoners, however. It was specifically for criminals who were a nuisance to other prisons. This was described as being the last resort to house the worst of the worst who had absolutely no chance of rehabilitation. On August the 11th, 1934, the first batch of prisoners entered the building. 137 criminals from California, from bank robbers to counterfeiters to murderers. Over the years, the structure began to fall into ruins and was in desperate need of repair, but this didn't happen and would inevitably lead to its downfall. Regardless, this prison would maintain its strong reputation, but only for 28 years. Frank Lee Morris was born on September the 1st, 1926 in Washington, DC. As a child, his parents abandoned him early on, and he was then sent to an orphanage at age 11. By 13, he began performing acts of crime, and it only intensified as he hit his late teens, being arrested for possessing drugs as well as armed robbery. As the years rolled by, he was arrested again for grand larceny, car theft, and more armed robbery. He served time in Florida and Georgia, and whilst serving 10 years for bank robbery, he managed to escape the Louisiana State Penitentiary. Just a year later, he was captured and sent to Alcatraz on January the 20th, 1960. John William Anglin was born on May the 2nd, 1930, and his brother Clarence May the 11th the next year in Donaldsonville, Georgia, growing up on a farm. As kids, they were incredibly close and became extremely skilled swimmers. Swimming in the dangerous waters of Lake Michigan when ice was still afloat on the surface. However, when Clarence was 14 years old, he broke into a service station and the two brothers soon began robbing banks together in the early 1950s. They would, however, specifically target businesses that were closed down so that nobody would get hurt. They only ever used a weapon once to rob a bank and it was actually a toy gun. In 1958, John, Clarence, and their other brother Alfred all robbed a bank in Columbia, Alabama, but were caught, all being given 35 years in prison. John and Clarence continuously attempted to escape, which is when they were sent to Alcatraz on October the 24th, 1960, and January the 10th, 1961, respectively. Alan West was born on March the 25th, 1929 in New York City, and would end up getting arrested over 20 times during his life. Eventually, he was locked up for stealing cars in 1955 at Atlanta Penitentiary and then Florida State Prison, the latter of which he would attempt to escape, which led to him being sent to Alcatraz in 1957 at the age of just 28. These four men were now all imprisoned in Alcatraz, but on June the 11th, 1962, they would regain their freedom. It was as early as 1960 when Alan West, who had been in Alcatraz for three years at this point, approached Frank Morris, who had only just arrived, and informed him of a plan to escape. Over the years, West had worked with the maintenance crew and therefore was given insight to the structure, layout and developments of the building. 
He believed there was a ventilation grate above cell block B that was unlike the others, as it wasn't covered with concrete and could therefore give them access to the roof. Soon, the other two inmates joined Alcatraz and also became part of their plan, as they had known one another from previous prisons. In December 1961, all four men requested to be moved to cell block B underneath the uncovered ventilation grates, all with cells right next to one another. And these requests were approved. For six months straight, they began to widen the ventilation ducts in their cell using saw blades they had found on the prison grounds, metal spoons from the mess hall, and an electric drill which they had taken from the motor of a vacuum cleaner. They would use cardboard and their own musical instruments to hide the progress that they had made and would do this during an hour in the day that was dedicated to the inmates playing music so that nobody would hear a sound. These grates were only around six inches thick, so they weakened them just enough to be able to push through. Eventually, the holes became big enough and they managed to make their way through to a utility corridor that wasn't guarded. They then climbed up to the empty level of the cell block and began setting up their own workshop. These inmates were given jobs to do in this area and they hung up blankets to supposedly collect dust and stop it from reaching the cells below. But in actuality, they were hiding the work they were doing for their escape instead. They even built their own periscope to keep a lookout. They used over 50 raincoats as well as other stolen or donated materials to build themselves life preservers as well as a 6 by 14 foot rubber raft. They stitched it together by hand and then sealed it with heat using nearby steam pipes. They used scrap wood and screws to build themselves paddles and then when ready would climb a ventilation shaft to the roof of the building and remove the rivets which were holding a large fan in place. While they were doing all of this, inside their cells, dummy heads that they had sculpted from soap, concrete and paper mache were lying in their beds, posing as the criminals. They even went as far as to paint the heads with real human hair that Clarence Anglin had access to as he worked as a barber, and they propped the beds with blankets to complete the illusion. The plan was foolproof and ready to go ahead. On June the 11th, 1962, it was time to take action. But Alan West ran into some trouble. The cement he had used to reinforce the concrete around the vent of his cell had hardened, which narrowed his escape and fixed the grill into place. By the time he was actually able to remove it and rewiden the hole again, the others had left without him, despite him being the original brain for this entire operation. Alan West returned to his cell and went to sleep. He was left behind. The other three inmates made it to the utility corridor and then climbed up the ventilation shaft to the roof. Guards did hear a loud crash at 10.30pm as they broke out of it, but they heard nothing more and didn't choose to investigate further. Dragging all of their equipment with them, the inmates slid down a pipe around 50 feet to reach the ground and climbed two 12-foot barbed wire fences. They were then in an area which worked as a blind spot for the searchlights and gun towers of the prison when they inflated their raft with a concertina which they had ordered months earlier. It was around 11pm when they boarded the raft and headed towards Angel Island. These three inmates were never seen again. The next morning, the inmates were ordered to wake up, but once the three missing prisoners failed to respond, the guard shook Morris and the dummy head fell onto the ground, revealing the ruse. Alcatraz was then put on lockdown as the entire island was searched. For the next 10 days, an extensive search took place in the air, the sea, and on the mainland. On June the 14th, three days after the escape, a paddle was found floating just off the southern shore of Angel Island. It's believed to have belonged to the escapees. That same day, in that same area, a wallet was found, wrapped in plastic, filled with names, addresses and photos of the Anglin brothers' closest friends and relatives. On June the 21st, 10 days since the escape, shreds of raincoat material were found on a beach not far from the Golden Gate Bridge. It's believed to have been parts of the raft that they had built. 
Later that same day, a prison boat discovered a deflated life jacket made from the same material, just off of Alcatraz Island. It belonged to the inmates. That same day, another was found, and it was still tied. The main theory was that the three men had drowned and died during their escape to the mainland. The fact that they had left such personal belongings behind led some to believe that they wouldn't have given them up so easily and would sooner have drowned than leave them behind. On July the 17th, 1962, over a month since the escape, a Norwegian ship spotted a body floating in the ocean around 15 miles from the Golden Gate Bridge. But they didn't report it until October, three months later. By then, the body was gone and couldn't be recovered. However, this was ruled out to have been one of the inmates, as it would have been incredibly unlikely for a body to have still been floating a month after death. It was theorized that it may have been 34-year-old baker Cecil Philip Herman, who had committed suicide from the Golden Gate Bridge just five days earlier. Though some do still believe that it's possible to have been one of the inmates. According to Alan West, the criminal left behind, the plan was to make it to Angel Island and to steal clothes and a car. But no such thefts took place, leading most to believe that they didn't even make it that far, finding it unlikely they would have survived the strong currents and freezing temperature of the San Francisco Bay. The bay's current is extremely strong and at the time would have been 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And the weather itself was 47 degrees. If they fell into the water, they may have only survived for around two hours. A reenactment took place and it was concluded that two men would have needed to have kept the raft inflated, which would have left just one to paddle on his own. Alan West may have been the essential fourth party that they would have needed to survive. Despite being left behind, West fully cooperated with the investigation to provide all details of the escape attempt though he was later fatally stabbed and killed on December the 21st, 1978. However, the official FBI report leaves even more question marks. It claimed that no further evidence was discovered, but the day after the escape took place, a raft was discovered on Angel Island and with footprints leading away from it. The report also claims that no similar crimes took place in the following days, but on the day after the escape, a 1955 blue Chevrolet was stolen in Marin County with the Californian license plate number KPB076. The next day, a motorist in Stocktown, California, 80 miles east of San Francisco, claimed to have been forced off the road by three men in a blue Chevrolet. Sightings of this vehicle spread to Oklahoma, Indiana, Ohio, and South Carolina. Up to three months after the escape, but this car was never located. On March the 21st, 1963, less than a year since the escape, Alcatraz officially closed its prison doors due to the poor condition of the building and the sheer financial difficulties it took to maintain. It wasn't until December the 31st, 1979, 17 years after the escape, when the FBI closed the investigation and decided that the men most likely died in the water using the items found as evidence. But that hasn't stopped other theories and explanations from popping up. The idea that these men would have been unable to survive the cold and rapid waters of the San Francisco Bay has been called into question. On December the 16th, 1962, just six months after the escape, another inmate of Alcatraz, John Paul Scott, used rubber gloves to make water wings and actually escaped the prison and successfully swam to Fort Point at the edge of the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. He was discovered by some teenagers but was suffering hypothermia and exhaustion. After he recovered in the hospital, he was recaptured and sent back to Alcatraz. Furthermore, to this day, two annual triathlon events take place in that bay, swimming from Alcatraz to Fort Point. And no swimmer has ever failed to make it there. And if you remember, the Anglin brothers were extremely skilled swimmers, especially in treacherous waters. Some even believe that the items left behind were a decoy to throw the police off the scent while they escaped in the complete opposite direction. 
Furthermore, it's even been theorised that Alan West's description of the plan may have been fictionalised. He may have provided a false lead of their direction and plans that night, allowing his fellow inmates more time to escape in the opposite direction. San Francisco police officer Robert Chechi claimed on the morning of the escape at around 1am, he saw an illegal boat in the bay near Alcatraz heading towards the Golden Gate Bridge. This led some to believe that the inmates may have hired some confederates to help them escape, but this claim was never deemed credible. Just one day after the escape, a man claiming to be John Anglin actually called lawyer Eugenie McGowan in San Francisco to arrange a meeting with the US Marshal's office. Eugenie refused and the man hung up the phone, though the FBI deemed this to be merely a prank. In January 1965, three years since they were last seen, a rumour began to circulate that Clarence Anglin was secretly living in Brazil. Some undercover agents investigated South America, but nothing was found. In 1967, five years since the escape, an unidentified man called up the FBI and claimed that he went to school with Frank Morris and had known him for 30 years. He then claimed to have bumped into him again in Maryland, and he now had a small beard and a moustache. But the man refused to give any more details. Family members of the Anglin brothers would receive strange postcards and messages over the years. Some were unsigned, though others did come in signed from Jerry, or Jerry and Joe. In December 1962, six months after the escape, the family received a Christmas card in their mailbox, signed from John. And all of these cards did match the Anglin's handwriting. But the envelopes were postmark stamped, so therefore some disregard this as evidence, as they could have been sent before the disappearance. One of their siblings, Robert, received a bizarre phone call where all he could hear was heavy breathing on the other end. He admitted that it could have been a prank call, but he always wondered if it was actually his brother's. The Anglin's mother would receive anonymous flowers every single Mother's Day until her death in 1973, 11 years after the escape. And even at her funeral, it was noted that two very strange and tall women in extremely heavy makeup attended. Nobody knew who they were, but they acted suspiciously, and the family believed it may have actually been the Anglin brothers showing up to pay their respects. In 1989, 27 years after the escape, the Anglin's father followed suit and also passed away. At his funeral, two complete strangers with beards showed up. They stood in front of the casket staring at the body crying, before suddenly walking out. That same year, a woman, who only called herself Kathy, claimed that Clarence Anglin matched the description of a man who lived on a farm near Mariana, Florida. Another woman also recognised him and reiterated this statement, correctly identifying his eye colour, height and other physical features. Another witness saw a sketch of Frank Morris and claimed that it bore a strong resemblance to a man she had seen around the same area of Mariana. In 1993, 31 years since they were last seen, former Alcatraz inmate Thomas Kent claimed that he had helped plan the escape. He claimed that Clarence Anglin's girlfriend was due to meet them on the mainland and to drive them all to Mexico. But Kent claimed he refused to escape himself because he couldn't swim. However, he was paid $2,000 for this interview and his claims were denied and seen as merely a publicity stunt. That same year, John Leroy Kelly was on his deathbed when he decided to make one final confession. He claimed that he and his partner picked up the criminals in a boat and took them to Seattle, Washington. He then claimed that he pretended he was going to take them to Canada but instead murdered them to get the $40,000 that the inmates' families had given them. However, Kelly detailed where the bodies were located, and this area was searched, but no remains were found. It wasn't until 2003, 41 years since the escape, when Mythbusters tested to see if this plan was possible, and concluded that it could have actually been successful. In 2010, 48 years since the inmates were last seen, 
Robert Anglin passed away, but he had reportedly told family members beforehand that he was in contact with his brothers up until 1987, and some family members even planned to visit Brazil to search for them. In 2011, 49 years since the escape, 89-year-old Bud Morris, who claimed to be the cousin of Frank Morris, claimed that he had previously given envelopes of money to prison guards of Alcatraz's bribes. He then claims to have met up with Frank in San Diego not long after the escape. His daughter, who was only 8 or 9 years old at the time, remembers her father meeting with Frank, but had no idea who he was at the time or about the escape. A study in 2014, 52 years since the prison break, showed that if they did in fact leave the island at around 11.30pm, they could have made it to Horseshoe Bay and any debris would have floated in the direction of Angel Island, which is exactly where the items were found. However, if they had left at any other time, their chances of making it out alive would have been unlikely. Over the years, a photograph was reported to have been taken in 1975, 13 years after the disappearance, taken by a family friend, Fred Britchie, who grew up with the Anglin brothers. He claimed that he recognised them in Rio de Janeiro and quickly took the picture. Forensic experts did believe that these men are the Anglins, but due to the poor condition of the picture and the fact that both men are wearing sunglasses, it's impossible to know for sure. Britchie himself also added an extra theory, that the trio didn't actually use the raft to cross the bay, but instead paddled around the island to reach the boat dock. On the night of the escape, an electrical cord was missing. They may have used this and attached it to the rudder of a prison ferry that did leave the island not long after midnight, which would have towed them completely safely to the mainland. However, some FBI agents called Fred Britchie a liar and a con man who had a history of making up stories. His own widow claimed that he had never once mentioned this story to her beforehand. But in January of 2020, the photo was analysed using new facial recognition techniques and concluded that the men in the photograph are in fact John and Clarence Anglin. In 2018, 56 years since the disappearance, the FBI confirmed that the San Francisco Police Department had received a letter five years earlier, supposedly written by John Anglin. In the letter, it claims that Frank Morris had died in 2008 and was buried in Alexandria under a fake name, while Clarence Anglin passed away in 2011. He was supposedly writing the letter to negotiate his surrender so he could seek medical treatment for his cancer, but the authenticity of this letter remains a mystery. So what happened to the three inmates who escaped this mighty prison? Did they perish in the waters on their way to the mainland? Were they captured and killed before they could find their freedom? Or did it all go completely as planned and they managed to make a new life for themselves elsewhere? These three men fled this prison nearly 60 years ago and it still raises discussion with a popular tour that continues to this day with people from around the world visiting the island seeking answers.